live on the floor in San Francisco for AWS Summit. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, here for the next two days, getting all the action. We're back in person. We're at AWS reInvent a few months ago. Now we're back, events are coming back, and we're happy to be here with theCUBE, bringing all the action. Also virtual, we have a hybrid cube. Check out thecube.net, siliconangle.com for all the coverage after the event. We've got a great guest kicking off here, Matthew Park, Director of Solutions Architecture with Innovation Solutions. The booth is right here. Matthew, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much, I'm glad to be here. So, we're back in person. You're from Tennessee, we were chatting before you came on camera. Um, it's great to be back to events. It's amazing. This is the first uh, summit I've been to in, what, two, three years? It's awesome. We'll be at the uh, AWS Summit in New York as well. A lot of developers, and the big story this year is, as developers look at cloud going, distributed computing, you got on-premises, you got public cloud, you got the edge. Essentially, the cloud operations is running everything. DevSecOps. Everyone kind of sees that. You got containers, you got Kubernetes, you got cloud native. So the, the game is pretty much laid out. Mm -hmm. And the edge is with the actions. You guys are number one premier partner at SMB for edge. That's right. Tell us about what you guys are doing at Innovative and uh, what you do. That's right. Uh, so I'm the director of solutions architecture. Uh, me and my team are responsible for building out the solutions that are around especially the edge, public cloud. For us, edge is anything outside of an AWS availability zone. Uh, we are deploying that in countries that don't have AWS infrastructure in region. They don't have it. Uh, Give an in, example. Uh, example would be Panama. We have a customer there that uh, needs to deploy some financial tech. Data and compute is legally required to be in Panama, but they love AWS and they want to deploy AWS services in region. Uh, so they've taken e EKS Anywhere, We've put Storage Gateway and uh, Snowball uh, in region, inside the country, and they're running their FinTech on top of AWS services inside Panama. You know, it's interesting, Matthew, is that we've been covering AWS since 2013 with theCUBE at their events, and we've watched the progression. Andy Jassy was, uh, was in charge, then became the CEO, now Adam Slepsky's in charge. But the edge has always been that thing they've been trying to avoid. I don't want to say trying to avoid. Of course, Amazon listens to customers, they work backwards from the customers, we all know that. Uh, but the real issue was they were their bread and butters, EC2 and S3. And then now they got tons of services and the cloud is obviously successful and seeing that. But the edge brings up a whole nother level. It does. Of computing. It does. That's not centralized in the public cloud. Now they got regions. So what is the issue with the edge? What's driving the behavior? Outpost came out as a reaction to competitive threats and also customer momentum around OT uh, operational technologies and IT merging. We see with the data at the edge, you got 5G I'm happy, so it's pretty obvious, but there was a slow transition. What was the driver for the edge? What's the driver now for edge action for AWS? Data is the driver for the edge. Data has gravity, right? And it's pulling compute back to where the customer's generating that data, and that's happening over and over again. You said it best, Outpost was a reaction to a competitive situation, whereas today we have over 15 AWS edge services, and those are all reactions to things that customers need inside their data centers, on location, or in the field, like with yeah. media companies. So Outpost is interesting, we always used to riff on theCUBE, because uh, it's basically Amazon in a box, pushed in the data center, uh, right. running native, all the stuff, but now cloud native operations are kind of becoming standard, you're starting to see some standards, Deepak Singh's group is doing some amazing work with open source, Raul's team on the AI side, obviously, uh, you got Swami who's giving the keynote tomorrow, you got the big AI machine learning, big part of that edge, now you can say, okay, Outpost, is it relevant today? In other words, did Outpost do its job, because EKS Anywhere, seems to be getting a lot of momentum. You see local zones, the regions are kicking ass for Amazon. This edge piece is evolving. What's your take on EKS Anywhere versus say Outpost? Yeah, I think Outpost did its job. It made customers that were looking at Outpost really consider, do I want to invest in this hardware? Do I, do I want to have um, this Outpost in my data center? Do I want to manage this over the long term? A lot of those customers just transitioned to the public cloud. They went into AWS proper. Some of those customers stayed on-prem because they did have use cases that were uh, not a good fit for Outpost. They weren't a good fit uh, in the customer's mind for the yeah. public AWS cloud inside an availability zone. Now what's happening is as AWS is pushing these services out and saying, we're going to meet you where you are with 5G. We're going to meet you where you are with Wavelength. 
we're going to meet you where you are with EKS Anywhere. Uh, I think it has really reduced the amount of times that we have conversations about outposts, and it's really increased. We can deploy fast. We don't have to spin up outpost hardware. We can go deploy EKS Anywhere in your yeah. VMware environment, and okay. it's increasing the speed of adoption. All right, sure. so you guys are making a lot of good business decisions around managed cloud service. That's Innovative right. does that. You get the cloud advisory, Absolutely. the classic professional services for the specific edge piece and, and doing that outside of the availability zones and regions for AWS. Um, customers in, in these new areas that you're helping out are, they want cloud. Like they want to have modernization, at modern applications. Obviously they got data, machine learning, and AI all part of that. What's the main product or, or, or gap that you're filling for AWS uh, outside of their availability zones or their regions that you guys are delivering? What's the key? Is yeah. it they don't have a footprint? Is it that it's not big enough for them? What's the real gap? What's why, why are you so successful? So what customers want when they look towards the cloud is they want to focus on what's making them money as a business. They want to focus on their applications. They want to focus on their customers. So they look towards the AWS cloud and say, AWS, you take the infrastructure, you take uh, some of the higher layers, and we'll focus on our revenue generating business. But there's a gap there between infrastructure and revenue generating business that Innovative slides into. Uh, we help manage the AWS environment. Uh, we help build out these things in local data centers with 32 plus year old company. We have traditional on-premises people yeah. that know about deploying hardware, that know about deploying VMware to host EKS anywhere, but we also have most of our company totally focus on the AWS cloud. So we're filling that gap and helping deploy these AWS services, manage them over the long term, so our customers can go to just primarily and totally focusing on their revenue generating business. So basically, you guys are basically building AWS edges. Correct. For Correct. companies. Correct. Mainly because the needs are there. You got data, you got certain products, whether it's you know, low latency type requirements. Right and then they still work with the regions, right? It's all tied together, right? Is that how right. it works? And, and our customers, even the ones in the edge, they also want us to build out the AWS environment inside the availability zone because we're always going to yeah. have a failback scenario. If we're going to deploy FinTech in the Caribbean, we're going to talk about hurricanes and we're going to talk yeah. about failing back into the AWS availability zones. So Innovative is filling that gap across the board, whether it be inside the AWS cloud or on the AWS edge. All right, so I got to ask you on the, since you're at the edge, in these areas, I won't say underserved, but developing areas where you now have data and you have applications that are tapping into that, that requirement, it makes total sense. We're seeing that across the board, so it's not like it's, a, it's an outlier, it's actually growing. Yeah. There's also the crypto angle, you got the blockchain. Are you seeing any traction at the edge with blockchain? Because a lot of people are looking at the Web3 in these areas like Panama, and you mentioned FinTech in, in, in the islands there. A lot of, lot of, lot of Web3 happening. What's your, what's your view on the Web3 world right now? Relative we, to we have some customers edge. actually deploying crypto, especially, um, especially in the Caribbean. I keep bringing the Caribbean up, <laughs> but it's, it's top of my mind right now. We have customers that are deploying crypto. A lot of co uh, countries are choosing crypto to underlie parts of their central banks. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's up and coming. Uh, I, I have some you know, personal views that, that crypto is still searching for a use case. Yeah. And uh, I think it's searching a lot and, and we're there to help customers search for yeah. that use case. Uh, but, but crypto as a, as a uh, technology um, lives really well on the AWS edge. Yeah. Uh, and, and we're having more and more people talk to us about that yeah. and ask for assistance in the infrastructure because they're developing new cryptocurrencies every day. Yeah. It's not like they're deploying Ethereum <laughs> or anything specific. They're actually developing new currencies yeah. and, and putting them out there on. It's interesting, I mean, first of all, we've been doing crypto for many, many years. We have our own little um, you know, projects going on, but if you look, talk to all the crypto people, they're saying, look, we do smart contracts, we use the blockchain. It's kind of over, a lot of overhead, and it's not really there technically yeah. already but it's a cultural shift. But there's underserved use cases around use of money, but they're all using the blockchain just for this, like smart contracts, for instance, right. or certain transactions. And they're going to Amazon for the database. Yeah. <laughs> and they all go, don't tell anyone we're using a centralized service. Well, what happened if you centralized? Yeah, and, so and that's, kind of, and that's the conversation. It's a performance issue. Right? Yeah, and, and it's a cost issue, yeah. and it's a development issue. Um, so I think, more and more as, as some of these uh, currencies maybe come up, some of the smart contracts 
get into, uh, if they find their use cases, I think we'll start talking about how does that really live on, on AWS and, and what does it look like to build decentralized applications but with AWS hardware and services. All right, so take me through a, a use case of a customer, um, Matthew, around the edge. Okay, so I'm a customer, pretend I'm a customer. Hey, you know, I'm, we're in an underserved area. I want to modernize my business. And I got my developers who are totally peaked up on cloud, uh, but we've identified that it's just a lot of overhead latency issues. I need to have a local edge and serve my app. I also want all the benefits of the cloud. So I want the modernization and I want to migrate to the cloud for all those cloud benefits and the goodness of the cloud. What's the answer? Yeah, uh, big thing is uh, industrial manufacturing, right? That's, that's one of the best use cases. Uh, inside industrial manufacturing, we can pull in many of the AWS Edge services. We can bring in uh, private 5G uh, so that all the uh, equipment inside that, that manufacturing plant can be hooked up. They don't have to pay huge overheads to deploy 5G. It's uh, better than Wi-Fi for the industrial space. Um, when we take computing down to that industrial area, uh, because we want to do pre-processing on the data. Yeah. We want to gather some analytics. We deploy that with uh, regular, commercially available hardware, running VMware, and we deploy EKS anywhere on that. Uh, inside of that manufacturing plant, uh, we can do pre-processing on things coming out of the, uh, the robotics, yeah. that, depending on what we're manufacturing, right? Uh, and then we can take those refined analytics and for very low cost, with maybe a little bit longer latency, transmit those back um, to the AWS availability zone, the, yeah. the standard For data, data lake or whatever. To the data lake, yeah, data lake house, whatever it might be. Um, and we can do additional data science on that once it gets to the AWS cloud. Uh, but a lot of that, uh, just-in-time business decisions, just-in-time manufacturing decisions, can all take place on an AWS service or services inside that manufacturing plant. And that's, that's one of the best use cases yeah. that we're seeing. And I think, I mean, we've been saying this on theCUBE for many, many years, moving data around is very expensive. Yeah. But also compute going to the data saves that cost yeah. on the data transfer, also on the benefits of the latency. So I have to ask you, by the way, that's standard best practice now for the folks watching, don't move the data unless you have to. Cool. Um, but there's new things are developing. So I want to ask you, what new patterns are you seeing emerging once this new architecture is in place? Love that idea, localize everything right at the edge, manufacturing, industrial, whatever the use case, retail, whatever it is, right? But now, what does that change in the, in the core cloud? So there's, a, there's a system element here. Yeah. What's the new pattern? There's actually an organizational element as well because yeah. once you have to start making the decision, do I put this compute at the point of use or do I put this compute in the cloud uh, now you start thinking about where business decisions should be taking place. Uh, so not only are you changing your architecture, you're actually changing your organization because you're thinking, you're thinking about a dichotomy you didn't have before. Uh, so now you say, okay, this can take place here uh, and maybe, maybe this decision can wait, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and then how do I visualize that? By the way, it could be a bots too doing the work for management. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you got observability going right? But you got to change the database architecture in the back, so there's new things developing. You've got more benefit. There are, there are. And, and we have more and more people that, that want to talk less about databases and want to talk more about data lakes because of this. They want to talk more yeah. about, customers are starting to talk about throwing away data. Uh, you know, for the past maybe decade, yeah. it's been store everything, and one day we will have a data science team that we hire in our organization to do analytics on this decade of data. Well, and I that's mean, this is, a, this is a great point. We don't have time to drill into. Maybe we do another session on this. But the one pattern we're seeing come out of the past year is that throwing away data is bad. Even data lakes that so-called turn into data swamps actually is not the case. You look at Databricks, Snowflake, and other successes out there, and even time series data, which may seem irrelevant yeah. after it's over actually matters when people start retraining their machine learning algorithms. Yep. So as data becomes code, as we call it in our last showcase, we did a whole, whole event on this, the data's good in real time and in the lake. Yep. Because the iteration of the data feeds the machine learning, training, things are getting better with the old data. So it's not throw it away. It's not just business benefits. Yep. There's all kinds of new scale. There are, and, and we have uh, many customers that are running petabyte level um, they're, they're essentially data factories on, on, uh, on premises, right? They're, they're creating so much data and they're starting to say, okay, we could analyze this uh, in the cloud, we could transition it, we could move petabytes of data to the AWS cloud, or 
We can run uh, computational workloads on premises. We can really do some analytics on this data, transition uh, those high level and sort of raw analytics back to AWS, run them through machine learning, um, and we don't have to transition 10, 12 petabytes of data into AWS. So I got to end the segment on a, on a kind of a um, fun note. I was told to ask you about your personal background, on-premise, architect, ADS Cloud, and skydiving instructor. <laughs> How does that all work together? What, tell, what does this mean? Yeah, uh, you I You jumped actually, out of a plane and got a job? You, you got a customer to jump out? Kind of, so you I, was, jumped uh, out? I was teaching skydiving uh, <laughs> before, I, before I started in the cloud space. This was 13, 14 years ago. I, was, uh, I still am a skydiving yeah. instructor. Uh, I was teaching skydiving, and I heard out of the corner of my ear uh, a guy that owned an MSP that was lamenting about um, you know, storing data and, and how his customers are working and he can't find enough people to operate all these workloads. So I walked over and said, hey, this is, this is what I went to school for. Like, I'd love to, you know, uh, I was living in a tent in the woods teaching skydiving. I was like, I'd love to yeah, not live in a yeah. tent in the woods. So uh, <laughs> uh, I started and the first day there, uh, we had a, a discussion. Uh, EC2 had just come out. Um, <laughs> and, uh, like, this is and, amazing. Yeah, and so we had this discussion. We should start moving customers here. And, uh, and that totally revolutionized that business. Um, that, that led to, uh, that, that guy actually still owns a skydiving airport. But, um, but through all of that and through being an on-premises, migrated me and myself, my career, into the cloud, and now it feels like uh, almost, <laughs> almost looking back and saying, now let's take what we learned in the cloud and, and apply those lessons and those services to on-premises. It's, so, it's such a great story, you know, I was going to, you know, you know the, 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 the whole you know, growth mindset, pack your own parachute, you know. Uh, exactly. You know, the cloud in the early days was pretty much, will the chute open? Yeah. Right? It was pretty much, you had to roll your own cloud at that time, yep. and so, you know, you, you jump on a plane, you got to make sure that parachute's going to open. And so was Kubernetes, by the way, 2015 or so, when, um, when that was coming out. It was, I mean, it was, it was still, and I may, maybe it does still feel like that to some people, right? Yeah. But uh, it, was, it was the same yeah. kind of feeling that we had in the early days wow. of AWS, the same feeling we have when it's we It's pretty much the door now open. with you guys, it's more like a tandem jump. Yeah. You know, yeah. But, but it's a lot, of, a lot of this cutting edge stuff, like jumping out of an airplane. Yeah. You got the right equipment, you got to do the right things. Exactly. Right. Matthew, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Great conversation. Thanks for having me. Okay, theCUBE's here live in San Francisco for AWS Summit. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Uh, we'll be at AWS Summit in New York coming up in the summer as well. Look up for that, look at this cal calendar for all theCUBE action at theCUBE.net. We'll be right back with our next segment after this break.